Ever since Darwin, biologists have understood the importance of the tree of life metaphor. In Philomath, we will learn how to infer that tree and how to use it to understand biological processes. Philomath is made possible through a career grant from NSF, as well as ongoing support from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. All right, when we start first starting a course, it's important to learn why we're doing this, right? So what's the point of making phylogenies? What's the point of using phylogenies? So by the end of this video, we'll learn how some concrete examples of what can be learned through this, and also some of the costs of ignoring phylogenies. And there's just a small taste of this. Of course, over the semester, you'll learn more, more about this. And just reading literature, you'll learn a more, more, lot more. But this is just to get you excited. Okay. So why do I do this? I started when I was an undergrad uh, working in Brian Farrell's lab. And so he was studying beetles. And so here's a bark beetle. And bark beetles are amazing. They dig these galleries in the wood, and they deposit, lay eggs. And then the larvae will hatch out of the eggs and start going through and dig more galleries. Okay. And <coughs> oftentimes, the larvae go through, they'll be surrounded by this fungus. And in some species, rather than eating the wood, they're actually eating, or eating the plant itself, they're eating the fungus that's eating the plant. Right? Sort of like the same way leafcutter ants don't eat leaves, they eat the fungus that they grow on the leaves. Okay? And the cool thing about phylogenetics is you can take this basic information plus some DNA sequences to build a phylogeny, an evolutionary tree, and use that to understand much, much more than you could from just observing species in the present day. Right? So for example, this tree maps on what, what um, groups of plants these beetles are, are on, right? or consuming, the consuming conifers, angiosperms. Where on the tree are, are they eating? Are they eating the phloem, are they eating the seeds, are they eating the pith, um, the xylem, um, and other traits too. So it's all shown in this tree and reconstructed in this tree. You can figure out when they switch from um, going from, from, in, from conifers to angiosperms. When in evolutionary time did that happen? Okay. You can map traits on this tree. So here, agriculture is mapped on. So this you know, evolved strategy. I mean, the female will have these little pockets to bring fungal hyphae to new um, trees and things like that. So it's a very co-evolved process. Um, how many times has that evolved? And according to this phylogeny, it's evolved seven times. It's pretty cool to think about agriculture evolving seven times in these beetles. You know, humans only evolved a few times. Right? A lot more history here, a lot more species, and seven origins. We can figure out when that happened. We can compare sister groups. So we'll talk more about what this means later, um, but basically it's like doing a twin study. And so you have a speciation event, one lineage went one way, one lineage went another way, and they differ in the total number of species they get. And it just so happens that those that evolved eat angiosperms have more species than those that evolve and eat conifers. Right? And so it suggests maybe eating angiosperms either increases the speciation rate or lowers extinction rate in these beetles. Right? We'll talk later in the semester about ways to test this. Okay? But it's a pretty cool conclusion you can draw just from looking at this tree. Um, we can look at other traits too. So origins of inbreeding. Right? So some of these beetles, you look at the, the larvae, first of all, it's a very weird sex ratio. You might have 20 females for every male offspring, which you know, violates Fisher's principle. It's kind of a cool evolutionary exception. And obviously the males look really weird. Rather than looking like this back beetle female, the males would be this sort of larval form thing that has this strongly armored head with jaws and this like, you know, wormy-like uh, abdomen, right? And it turns out the males will impregnate their sisters and then go next door and try to impregnate those females, right? And the, well, their brother will fight them off, right? And it looks like inbreeding is associated with origins of agriculture. Right? Not completely, but they tend to hang out together. And so we can try to test, is this actually a valid correlation? And if so, why might that be? Which came first? Did agriculture lead to inbreeding or inbreeding lead to, lead to agriculture? Okay. And so this was published as a paper. And so, you know, for me, the power of phylogenetics is being able to get at all these questions about evolutionary history, diversification, trade evolution, from just a few observations of nature and some sequences or other ways to get this tree. So what do other people use it for? Well, here's a phylogeny of dinosaurs. And as you should know by now, um, birds are dinosaurs. So dinosaurs did not go extinct. You have them every Thanksgiving for dinner. Um, and so this tree show, shows that. It's been shown by many other people before this. Um, this you all, they also use this phylogeny to look at rates of evolution, found that birds are evolving at a much faster rate than other dinosaurs were. And they have to do with flight, they have to do with small body size, something to investigate. Um, Polar bears, you know, are severely endangered. Um, 
population is dropping, climate change is wiping them out, and so forth. Um, and one relevant question is, how old are they? So are they just, you know, white brown bears, right, related to grizzlies, and so not very different? Or are they of unique evolutionary lineage? And so early work due to phylogeny with mitochondrial DNA found they were fairly young, you know, between 110, 111, and 166,000 years old. Right. Later work with other gene genes show that they're actually much older than that, almost half a billion years old. Right. And on the right hand side, you see the phylogeny where we see this deep divergence between brown bears and polar bears, and then some introgression later of some genes. So there's been some genetic mixing, but overall polar bears are a long distinct thing from brown bears. Okay. Found through the power of phylogenetics. Um, metagenomes and sequencing. So here's an entirely new class of bacteria that are discovered by just going out, sequencing stuff, making a tree, and finding these critters that are not found elsewhere, um, that haven't been looked at before. Okay, so a new discovery from DNA sequencing and mapping it onto evolutionary history. Okay. Here's a proton pump. And so these scientists looked at evolution of a proton pump, and rather than just you know, trying to figure out how it worked together, they actually mapped its evolution on a phylogenetic tree, figured out what it must have looked like in the past, and then uh, made yeast actually uh, produce these ancestral proteins. So they could say, okay, now grow a protein that has this exact sequence, do it, and then actually test to see how, how it functioned in the lab. Right? Was it functional? Um, was it less efficient? And so forth. So you can use phylogenies to actually recreate the past. It's kind of amazing. Um, you can also use it to create new hypotheses to test. So in some worker ants, um, there are super soldiers, and these robust workers uh, that defend colonies and fight off other things. Um, and so it could be that, you know, there are, from the phylogeny, they suggest that there is a gene that leads to this, and it might still be present, but not active in the ones that don't have super soldiers. And so they um, tried inducing activation of this gene in ones that weren't, didn't have super soldiers and developed super soldiers. So it suggests that, you know, from this phylogeny, they made a prediction about a gene being present and then could test it and find out, yep, it's there. We often see groups that have very different diversity, right? And so we often talk about like adaptive radiations and key innovations leading to diversity and things like that. And with phylogenetics, we actually get at some of the mechanisms for that. So here, Wagner et al. performed a study where they looked at cichlids um, to see what could have led to their remarkable radiations. And so they tried to look at different traits to see, you know, does living in higher or low elevation matter? Does having sexual dichromatism matter? Or other traits to see what leads to higher diversification in this group. Okay, so now I can go from just speculating about that to actually testing hypotheses using the power of phylogenetics. We can also look at speciation and extinction rates. So here, these, these authors looked at speciation rates in birds, and some of them were sexually dichromatic. So think about a cardinal, bright red cardinal, versus male versus a browner female, right? Versus birds that are more similar in between males and females in color, and found that the ones that were more, more distinct had a faster speciation rate. Now, it could be due to sexual selection, leading to speciation happening faster, or other mechanisms. Right, but now we can actually test these approaches, these, these ideas, using phylogenase. Okay. Um, this will help, help understand correlations between traits. So here are leaf size and leaf lifespan, paper by Ackley and Reich. Um, and we look at this and it looks kind of weird, right? So we have you know, this negative correlation right, between those plants that have really long-lived leaves are really small leaves, and really big leaves you lose quickly, which doesn't make a lot of sense, right? You think about, I have this giant, expensive leaf, I toss it away quickly. This tiny little leaf, I hold on to it for a long, long time, right? Why might that be? And by looking at this, these traits, but then putting them on a phylogeny, um, you can then correct for phylogenetic history. And they found <coughs> that what matters was not you know, this, this, this presumed correlation, but there's one distinction between angiosperms and conifers. So conifers have needles, small leaves, they hold on to it for a long time. Angiosperms have large leaves, they often lose pretty quickly, right? And so what you've done by ignoring the phylogeny on the left is basically overcount it. So you take every time you see an angiosperm, you count it as a new evolution of this pair of traits. And if you see conifers, you see a new evolution of this pair of traits. But actually, that difference happens on one branch, and then all angiosperms are pretty similar, all conifers are pretty similar. 
Okay, and once you remove that correlation due to history, you find out there's no actual correlation. Okay, um, other times you remove correlation due to history, you find there's still correlation or, or reverse direction of correlation, right? But without that, you sort of overcounted these changes, and so you get the wrong answer. Okay, and so that's just what one divergence there, that x is between angiosperms and conifers. Okay, so what I try to show you today is what phylogenetics can be used to reveal ancestral states, differential diversification, just speciation extinction processes, informative new experiments, character correlations, evolutionary history, and of course, much, much more. Okay, so hopefully you're excited enough to learn about what else we can do over the course of this course.